This alternative use program was made during the presidential campaign of 1988, but not with an establishment candidate. CIA used by the Democratic uh, administration to murder DM and escalate the war in Vietnam. And here we have a Republican using the CIA to sell weapons to the Ayatollah, to raise funds, deal in drugs, go to Central America, fight wars that have not been approved by the people or the Congress. I think uh, George Bush is uh, deep into it, well over his head. Libertarians detest drug dealers. And that's one reason why we want to get rid of the laws. We want to get the drug dealer out of business overnight because he can't exist unless the drug price is very high. So a lot of good people inadvertently are the allies of the drug dealers if they like the drug laws. And isn't it interesting how recent they used it in the Vietnam era? Democrats used it there. Republicans used the FBI to spy on a hundred different groups in this country, including the churches who disagree with the policy in uh, Central America. It almost looks like the FBI was designed to spy on Americans who might be disagreeing uh, with policy, especially the foreign policy. Former Republican Congressman Ron Paul is now running for president on the Libertarian ticket. Join us for a provocative hour right now on Alternative Views. <laughs> Although the election of 1988 for president is long past, still the views of the non-establishment candidates should be heard. And that's what we're going to do on Alternative Views. Alternative Views over the years has had people from third parties who were running for president of the United States. We had the Libertarian candidate uh, last time, and we were fortunate to have the Libertarian candidate for president again. Ron Paul was congressman from uh, Houston. In fact, he was elected four times. And what is really of significance as a Republican that he has switched over and become the Libertarian candidate for president. Perhaps one of the main reasons is that he was a member of the House Banking and Currency Committee, so he actually could see very clearly how the U.S. economic system and political system worked. Well, before we have our interview with Ron Paul, here are some news stories from the alternative press. So far, the most sensational story that's emerged during the 1988 presidential election is that George Bush's office was directly involved in a drug and gun running operation that was supplying weapons to the countries and that was using proceeds from drug sales with connections with the Columbia um, cocaine cartel to help finance different Contra operations. This story was first broken in the Progressive last year. This was the story behind Dan Rather's questioning about uh, George Bush's connection with Noriega and drug dealers in uh, Central America. And the story recently broke in Newsweek and has been very briefly touched in television networks like ABC and CBS which have only barely touched on some of the details of this story. Well, In These Times has an in-depth interview this week in their June the 8th uh, issue in which they go into detail about this operation by one of the people that was intimately involved in it. Former CIA agent Richard Brenica said that he was one of the arms suppliers who was giving arms to the Contras, was involved in drug running back to the United States, and was in personal touch himself with George Bush's office during this um, operation. According to Brenica, this operation began in 1983 when Congress cut off military aid to the Contras, and the Reagan administration started organizing independent operations 
to illegally bring arms to the Contras. One of these operations was organized by Israel, by the Israeli intelligence agency Mossad that was supplying arms to the Contras and that got involved at that time with General Noriega in uh, Panama. The Israeli operation found out that Noriega was involved in drug running, decided that this would be a profitable way to, to finance the arms supplies to the Contras, and thus went in business with General Noriega themselves to uh, raise uh, money through drug sales to provide uh, arms to the um, Contra. It's very interesting, Doug. In the right-wing newspaper, The Spotlight, it has a story parallel to this, and it said that Noriega had had a long-term relationship with the Israeli secret police, particularly a fellow named Michael Harari. Right. Um, Noriega had been sort of blackmailing Bush, saying that because Bush's office was connected with this uh, network and these uh, operations, that if they tried to expose his drug operations, he would expose Bush. And indeed, in 1987, Bush himself told the congressional Iran-Contra agencies that were uh, investigating the Oliver North Network to keep their eyes off of this Mossad Israeli uh, arms to the Contras uh, network because this would endanger Israel's security uh, interests. <laughs> and it appears that it was Bush's own office that was coordinating this with the uh, Israelis. Now the information comes from this guy, uh, this former CIA agent Richard Brennica, who was involved in this uh, network selling arms to the uh, Contras and using uh, drug money to uh, help um, uh, finance this. And he said that he was himself personally uh, supervised by Donald Gregg, who is George Bush's uh, national security advisor, who is Bush's closest uh, political advisor, and who was previously in the CIA with uh, Bush. He was his def deputy director when Bush was the uh, head of the CIA. According to uh, Brennica, he called uh, Greg for the first time in 1983 and claimed that he talked to him four or five times um, after that. And he also had several conversations about the arms network with uh, one of Greg's uh, deputies, Lieutenant uh, Colonel Douglas uh, Minereshek, and that all of these conversations talked about the details of the uh, arms operations in which Mossad was uh, providing arms uh, to the uh, Contras. And Brennica also said that he was warning Greg and other people in the uh, Bush office that uh, these were being financed by drug sales and that some of the same planes that were being used to ship uh, weapons, arms, to the Contras were flying back to the United States with uh, drugs that were being used to um, uh, finance uh, this scheme, and Brennica himself said he flew on one plane back to Amarillo, uh, Texas, that was loaded with uh, uh, cocaine oh that he saw being um, unloaded. According to Newsweek, the published uh, part of this uh, story, um, Brennica said that Greg, uh, who is Bush's um, security advisor, replied to him when he talked about the drug uh, stories. He said, this is Greg, you do what you were assigned to do. Don't question the decisions of your um, uh, betters. So it's obvious that a, a cover-up uh, was involved by the uh, Bush office that wanted to keep these operatives um, quiet. The people who have run these drugs and have been the pilot for bringing these drugs back in the United States have told the uh, Kerry panel in Congress that the CIA the Drug Enforcement Administration and the Customs Service were aware that all this drug smuggling was going on, but they didn't do anything to stop it. So you have all of these things going on at the same time. So they say, well, did Bush know? If he didn't know, that would be damaging. He doesn't know what's happening in his own house. But if he did know and didn't stop him, he, he may not be president. Well, but the media aren't jumping on this. Right. Ed Meese, who's been the subject of many different scandals that the media have focused on in intimate uh, detail, actually told the federal drug enforcement agents in Miami to uh, lay off of some investigations of the North uh, Drug Network because of national security uh, requirements. It, so Meese obviously knew that some of these drug uh, networks were involved with the Contras. 
but the Reagan administration's priority during this time was to keep the Contras going no matter what. This was Reagan's obsession. And so Meese and these other Reagan administration officials were able to tolerate the Contras being uh, drug runners if that was what was needed to fund their military mm -hmm. um, operations. So there's no question but that Meese was involved in a uh, cover-up. The question is, uh, what did Bush know? Mm -hmm. And um, what if this is going to come out? You uh, mentioned the banks involved in the laundering. The Spotlight had a story in which we presented to you a while back about how none of this would be able to take place without the connivance and cooperation of the big U.S. banks. Those wonderful people who are back there in Wall Street, uh, like Chase Manhattan and Citicorp, et cetera, et cetera, they're the ones who take the money and launder it for those good uh, drug lords down there. We'll have some more news later, but now let's have our interview with Ron Paul, who's running for president on the Libertarian ticket. As a Republican, he was elected to the House of Representatives four times. Well, what about the Libertarian Party? Can you tell us a little bit about what it stands for? Libertarian Party is based on a firm principle of non-aggression. We all take a pledge when we join the party that we will never initiate force against somebody else. And that is uh, you know, a pretty simple principle that everybody should endorse. It's a principle of what makes civilization. That is, you respect other people's life, and you respect other people's property. Thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not murder. It's, it's that simple, and most everybody agrees to that. And the next question ought to be is, well, why, does, why should you be different than Republican and Democrats if they tend to agree with that same principle? Well, we, we believe it's such an important moral principle that if we can't take somebody else's property and we can't hurt anybody or we can't intimidate anybody or threaten to use force, we don't think the government can either. But we see the government as the initiator of force to bring about social and economic changes day in and day out. I mean, they, they may not come up to our front door with a gun, and occasionally they do, but we know if we don't deliver our money and our records and do obediently what the government wants in order to give up our portion of our income through the Internal Revenue Service, the gun will be quickly at our door and we will be in prison. So it's the threat and the intimidation, and therefore they're transferring well, something that we can't do as individuals. So we as libertarians reject this whole idea of forcible redistribution of wealth, which is the welfare state. Same way in personal liberties. We apply this principle in the area of personal liberties, mm -hmm. and although I might want you and think you should leave a certain, lead a certain lifestyle, because I think it's good and right and moral, I have no right to tell you what to do. You know, if, if you want to live a certain way, and I disagree, that's, that's tough. You know, that's your, your choosing. That's the individual's choice, as long as you don't hurt somebody else. So the person has the right to his own life and his liberty, his own lifestyle, as with one special rule that your lifestyle, the individual's lifestyle, can't hurt somebody else. So if you do things that I disapprove of, I as a libertarian am tolerant and I accept that up until the point of no injury to anybody else. Now I talk uh, to libertarians or listen to them or view them on TV and they're talking about government power all the time and abuse of governmental power. But I also see some libertarians, not a whole lot of them, but a lot of them also talk about corporate power as well. In other words, they're talking about power in general. There seem to be two types of libertarians. Well, um, I, don't, I don't find, I, I think we have one type of libertarian because we all accept the same principle. I think it's more easily found that you have several types of Republicans and several types of Democrats because they're interventionists and they can intervene any way they want. But uh, I think the libertarians are pretty consistent in certainly condemning the power of government. Uh, I haven't heard a libertarian saying that we need more government or they're not a libertarian. But on the corporate power, I think where the confusion might come is corporate size, if it's gained by serving the consumer, is not necessarily evil. So if, uh, if you have 90% uh, of the car industry, for some miraculous reason or for some unknown reason there's no imports if you have 90 percent of it that doesn't bother me as a libertarian if you have the best car at the best price and the consumers are very happy now if you own if you have 90 percent or 100 percent of a utility company and you're gouging the customers and the customers have no place else to go we detest 
the corporate size. We detest corporate power when it's gained through government power, you know, government coercion, if it's a contract. Uh, the military industrial complex is a pretty good example of how large industries benefit by big government. Of course, in big banking, big banks benefit by this monetary system because they're sort of in collusion with the Federal Reserve System, so we detest that. We detest bigness and we detest corporate power when it's gained through privilege from government. If corporations are large, and, and there's always free entry in a free market, if they're large because they serve the consumer, we don't worry too much about that because we know the consumer is benefiting. If they get to the point if they had 100% of an industry, which is not possible in a free market, but let's say just for instance, if they had 100% and then they started to gouge the people, there would immediately be competition. The people, you know, there has to be, there always has to be free entry and free competition. But there's nobody's ever figured out uh, where there's ever been a, a true monopoly in a free market system. The, all monopolies can be traced to some form of government protectionism. Well, of course, now we talk about uh, government and um, corporations, but as you've said, up at the top, they're all the same people. The uh, corporate uh, executives go to and from the uh, government. They hold positions in the government. Uh, the uh, people from the uh, Trilateral Commission and the Bilderbergers and all, they're all corporate people and uh, they have their relationships and interlocks with the banks and with uh, universities and foundations and all that. So to talk about one, so you're really talking about one source of power instead of corporation on one side and government on the other, because it's all one pot, as you said. I, I think it's become one pot. Not only that is uh, you don't have any help by, say, voting for a Democrat who may be a little more critical of large corporations. But we know Democrats are just as much in bed with big government, too. I mean, you take a Michael Dukakis, for instance. Uh, do you think maybe uh, Boston uh, was a somewhat dependent on some military contracts with Tip <laughs> O'Neill? I mean, they're just as much. It's all demagoguery when it comes to these political campaigns. So uh, either side, they're, they're the same people control it. And, you know, Ronald Reagan spoke sharply against the Trilateral Commission, but he was the first president to host the Trilateral Commission in the White House. I mean, that's how blatant it is. It's, this, it's the same group of people. Uh, that's why uh, you find uh, no political action committee, no large corporation who supports libertarians. I voted while in Congress, I think, the, the, uh, the strictest free market set of votes ever, but I never got political action committee money. But small business people who want to compete against big business, they're, they're free market people and they're much more likely to be libertarians and believe in the principles of free enterprise. But once the corporations get real large, and they're more interested in paying a couple hundred thousand dollars for a top lobbyist who knows the system, who can get a regulation that exempts their corporation or gets their contract in place. And uh, this, this is the way the system works, so we reward uh, the lobbyists and the political action committees much more so than we reward a principle of freedom. What about this uh, banking and currency committee? Uh, and we've had uh, Congressman Gonzalez on, who's one of your colleagues, yes. and he sees the world very clearly and sees the power structures at work. And I'm sure you have a clear picture of this also. Is this one of the reasons you became a libertarian instead of a Republican? Well, it's certainly one of the reasons why I got involved in politics, because I was very fascinated with economics and particular, particularly monetary policy. And um, if you think about it, money is pretty important. If you look at all transactions, whether you're buying something or selling your services, one half of all economic transactions is the monetary unit. So if somebody has control over the value of the monetary unit, they control every transaction. Therefore, if you have an institution, such as a government-ordained bank, like a central bank, like our Federal Reserve, if they have absolute monopoly control over the value of that currency, they control everything in the economy. It becomes a form of a government-regulated economy. It doesn't become socialism, but the money, obviously, is socialistic in that the government controls it. So if they increase the supply, the value goes down. If they tighten the supply, interest rates go up. So it's tremendous economic power. And the insiders, those who know what the policy is, literally can benefit. They don't stuff their pockets and line their pockets with cash. That's not the way it happens. But those who are in the inside and knowledgeable 
will benefit because they know which direction interest rates are going and which way the economy is going. And uh, if you look at the members of the Federal Reserve, you find out that they don't ask people like me to be on the Federal Reserve, even though I've had experience on studying the issue and been on the banking committee. They ask only the people who are casually referred to as the insiders, those from Wall Street and the banking industry, the Paul Volkers and the Alan Greenspans of the world, they're on the inside. They know how to deal with the establishment and they get these positions and therefore it is a tremendous amount of economic power falls in the hands of what we call the Open Market Committee, the Federal Open Market Committee. They control from day to day the supply of money. They become the legal counterfeiters. You know, if you and I had control of the printing press, we could do a lot of, a lot of things, you know, self-serving. That's what happens when the politicians create the central bank that, that control the money. Now, this control of the central bank and the money goes on regardless of which party is in power, right? It never changes. You know, uh, uh, they change a person here and there, but it's always the insiders. It's always from the same group. So if you have a Republican as president or the Democrats, they're going to get the same appointments. Appointments never change. And this can be said about the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of Treasury and, and the Federal Reserve Board members. They all come from the same group. And even though, I guess naively, I th was hopeful that the same group of individuals would not have as much power under, Ron under Ronald Reagan. But, you know, I was there, I witnessed it, and of course that led to my disenchantment, my disappointment, enough to the point where I just said, I've had enough, and then I left the Republican Party and joined the Libertarian Party with the idea that you cannot trust Republicans to be independent of the system either, although Ronald Reagan led us to believe that he would be independent. <laughs> record for civil liberties for the libertarians, uh, to my mind, is very good. Um, and even, uh, I think it was the, the last interview we did with a libertarian candidate for president said that he would abolish the CIA, the FBI, and the uh, uh, IRS. Do you hold those same positions? Yes, I do, because, uh, you know, most of our history, we didn't, didn't have those institutions. The FBI came in uh, during the First World War, and Interestingly enough, the one thing that Woodrow Wilson did, he used the FBI to spy on American citizens and actually arrest them if they disagreed with his foreign policy about going to war in Europe. And isn't it interesting how recent they used it in the Vietnam era? Democrats used it there. Republicans used the FBI to spy on a hundred different groups in this country, including the churches who disagree with the policy in uh, Central America. It almost looks like the FBI was designed to spy on Americans who might be disagreeing uh, with policy, especially the foreign policy. So the FBI, although I don't think I could condemn everything they've ever done, because I'm sure uh, some of the investigations and investigation of crime uh, has been beneficial, but that could be accomplished through Justice Department within our states. We wouldn't reject that pr uh, portion of it. But I think the, the FBI has uh, kept and continues to keep a lot of records on a lot of individuals. The CIA has only been here since 1947. Their record is lousy. I mean, just think of the CIA used by the Democratic uh, administration to murder Diem and escalate the war in Vietnam. And here we have a Republican using the CIA to sell weapons to the Ayatollah, to raise funds, deal in drugs, go to Central America, fight wars that have not been approved by the people or the Congress. So we see the CIA as very, very detrimental, skirting the law, and here we had Casey proposing a super CIA. He thought there was too much uh, 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 control over the CIA that existed that congressmen now occasionally ask questions, and they don't ask enough. So they were talking about a super CIA. The CIA was used in uh, a bad policy in, in Cuba. Uh, we think that intelligence gathering is permissible to defend this country. But up until 1947, it was done as a military operation. If you needed to know whether there were troops massing for an invasion, that the CIA ought to know about, or the, uh, we ought to know, get that information, uh, have that intelligence. Uh, but now in this age, especially in the modern age, I mean, we don't even need to have somebody over in Europe or in, in the Soviet Union. We don't even need to send uh, powers in an airplane over Europe. We have satellites. You can practically uh, watch an individual walking around on the street with the technology available. So, so I would say even modern technology has uh, absolutely moved us into an age where we ought to become more modern and get away from this uh, CIA operative snooping around, actually causing a lot more trouble than good.
Does that include all these uh, interventions and covert actions and surrogate uh, mercenaries which we're using in Central Absolutely. America? Absolutely, we would do away with that. But that doesn't mean that we would <clears throat> complacently say that we shouldn't have a national defense. If we're concerned about the spread of communism, one of the first things we as libertarians would do would be to stop the funding of the communists. You know, we're still sending money to the communists. Increased under the Reagan administration. It's unbelievable what we've been, we've been doing. But if there is a threat to our national security, rather than using these secretive operatives going around and murdering and picking and choosing our personal dictators that serve our banking and business interests, it should be done through the Congress. Congress should know about it. It's the people's money and it's the kids' lives that are being dealt with. So therefore, it should be open. If our national security is threatened, Congress ought to have a vote on it, never secretly with the power of a president to wage war. That's a very dangerous thing to happen. Some libertarians are against the public school system. They would close down the public school system. Do you think this is a good thing or do you believe in that? Well, I, I don't think the public school system has a real good record. I think the uh, educational quality is very, very low and getting lower all the time. I think that you can go to some of the big cities and you find out that it's, the schools are drug infested and crime infested and there's violence and very little education. More than a million kids drop out a year before they get their high school diploma. It's an armed uh, fortress. and. Uh, so we think the record is very poor, so we have concern about good education. And uh, of course, we want to go in the direction of uh, privatizing all schools. But in the very practical world of politics, uh, I don't think it's wise for me to say that tomorrow we could have private schools. I don't think it's likely to happen. So we can do a whole lot, set our ideals, work toward it, and we could change a whole lot. I think where we really have gone astray, has been in this century where we have gotten in probably in the last 30 or 40 years when we got the federal government involved. And the local governments have been involved in schools most of our history. And I think if we had the federal government out of it and the state governments and schools were controlled locally, although that wouldn't be perfect libertarianism, it would be a far cry better than what we have. But even short of doing all that, we as libertarians would really promote a little competition. We don't like monopolies when they're government monopolies because that's really the only government, only monopoly you get. But a monopoly over school system is, is a great danger. So we would immediately introduce the idea, and we think it would help the schools right off. And that is allow tax credits or vouchers for people who want prayer in the schools. How can we force people to have prayer in school? You know, that's a violation of civil liberties. But what we could do is say, if you don't like the way your kids are being taught, let's allow you to have competition. Let's give you a tax credit or a voucher and go down the street and have the kind of school you want. So we would want competition. That, to me, would be a practical alternative uh, and moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I guess the most uh, controversial uh, stand which libertarians have now is on drugs. Uh, you probably get uh, a lot of criticism because you want to legalize uh, drugs, right? Well, but I think the most controversial thing about the whole drug problem is it's zero tolerance. I think that's, that's what's uh, controversial, this idea that we have no privacy. There's no financial privacy or privacy in our home because the Drug Enforcement Agency can break our doors down looking for a cigarette butt. Uh, they confiscate cars and boats and houses are bulldozed down all in the name of, uh, of uh, teaching people not to have bad habits. They're spending $10 billion. I think it's a, an incredible program of failure. Uh, so the controversy is really uh, in the hands of the government, Democrats and Republicans who are saying the same thing, and each party tries to outdo the other, and they're absolutely obsessed with this. At the same time, they care not a lit about, you know, our civil liberties. But the drug laws have only been here since 1914. About that time we had the income tax, the Federal Reserve System, the FBI, licensing to protect certain industries and professions. Then we decided we we're going to tell people how to live and what their habits ought to be. That's when they introduced the ideas of prohibition of alcohol. Didn't work very well, and so that was finally repealed. But libertarians detest drug dealers. And that's one reason why we want to get rid of the laws. We want to get the drug dealer out of business overnight because he can't exist unless the drug price is very high. So a lot of good people inadvertently are the allies of the drug dealers if they like the drug laws. The people who write those laws and like those laws inadvertently promote crime. 
every drug addict, because he has to pay these exorbitant amounts for their drugs, commit on the average 260 felonies a year to raise the money. That would be totally unnecessary. Who raises that kind of money to go buy a six pack at the drugstore? They don't have to do that because the alcohol is available. And alcohol kills more people than drugs. Cigarettes, they kill 325,000 people a year. And what are we required to do? Subsidize the tobacco industry. I mean, if people want to really do good, let's just quit the subsidizing tobacco, get the government out of the sale of alcohol, and and, and go that way. But the crime rate would go down, the drug dealers would be out of business, I think the kids wouldn't be as exposed either. It's pretty hard to tell a kid that's just dropped out of a public school where he was totally bored and he's on the street corner and decides he wants a job and buy a car. Talk him into working at McDonald's for $4 an hour when he can make $400 a day doing a little work for the local drug merchant. There's no way. He's tempted and he yields to the temptation so we literally uh, set the stage by these drug laws to get more kids involved, and I think that's horrible. I think the kids have to, they certainly deserve some protection. We deserve at least to create an environment where they're not so uh, likely to be forced into the drug trade. Now, you're a medical doctor, and you think that uh, legalizing all these drugs would be good. Does the, do your medical colleagues and the medical profession, they agree with this? No, uh, to a minority. Matter of fact, I think that uh, uh, even drugs for uh, treating oneself should be more readily available to people. Uh, not that I think people should do it unwisely and use a lot of fancy medication without some advice, but if drugs were more available, if, you know, if a nurse could prescribe penicillin, it certainly would be a lot cheaper. Nurses are capable of telling you whether you have a strep throat or not. It would drive the cost down. So doctors have a little protectionism involved. They like their little monopoly. So the AMA, yeah. matter of fact, the AMA uh, lobbied me in Washington to vote against even allowing doctors to give heroin for dying cancer patients who couldn't have their pain relieved from morphine. But they were they they did not want this to happen because it didn't want they wanted to have control and they didn't want to look like they were soft on drugs, but they want control. So whether it's the drugs necessary right now, the FDA I think is does a horrible disservice to us all by making it very difficult for AIDS and cancer patients to do alternative treatments. Yes. You know, they're smuggling drugs from Mexico. You know, we think of Mexico as a socialist state, and yet they can get drugs more readily there. And we're having dying cancer patients, AIDS patients, smuggling drugs up into the free. United States in order for them to take this medicine, but the FDA argues, well, we've got to make sure it's safe and effective. Well, if somebody's dying, don't you think they have the right to take a chance on a drug, on an experimental drug? But the AMA isn't helpful in here, and the medical profession is very poor. A lot of doctors would agree with me, but I think they like the idea that they're sort of godlike, and they get to write prescriptions, and they certainly uh, think that uh, opening up uh, uh, this whole uh, barrel, so to speak, would be detrimental to their protection and their, their interest in organized medicine. What about the police uh, and law enforcement profession? Would they be for your point of view? It would put a lot of them out of work. <laughs> I think uh, a, a lot of them would make a lot less money. You know, it's, it, it, their system has been corrupted by it. Oh, gosh, it's you terrible. Know, it's, uh, you know, another example of how foolish some of these laws are is they, the prisons are running rampant with drugs. If we can't keep drugs out of the prison, how are we going to keep drugs off the street? Which means it's a very, a very much a corrupting influence. I mean, we, we read stories. I'm sure the majority of the police are not involved, but you don't need very many to really make a lot of money off mm -hmm. it. So there are going to be some officials uh, who would agree with us, uh, and I've had some. I had a, there was an interesting story of an individual when my staff went to work for a candidate who was running for a, a governorship in a large city, and they brought all the district attorneys together because crime was the number one issue in that state. And they made the, uh, they said that uh, the only way you could ever get rid of crime would be, and they all agreed on this, is you'd have to get rid of the drug laws. So behind closed door without the press, they agreed the drug laws created crime. And you know what they said? You can't ever achieve that because there are too many people on the take. Too many judges and too many policemen <laughs> like this. So just forget about it. We can't deal with it. And it's too much of an emotional issue anyway. But it is an important issue. I think the discussion has progressed a whole lot in the last six months. I think we as libertarians have done a whole lot of good in getting this discussion out and I am going to continue to debate this because as a parent of five children and as a physician and as a non-drug user I think that I uh, have some credibility in, in making this uh, debate 
uh, on the idea that drugs ought to be decriminalized. Let's talk about what could be the most explosive issue of this campaign if the mass media would get a hold of it and do something about it, but they're covering it up. And that is the, you, you were talking about the government involvement in drugs. Uh, there have been government investigations, there have been private investigations, and we've interviewed a lot of people, ex-CIA uh, people, who have talked about the CIA involvement in drug operations for many decades. It's public knowledge, though once again the media are not saying anything about it, that Oliver North and his people involved with the, the Contras have been running drug operations, cocaine primarily, bringing it back into the United States. And there are other uh, investigations which show that George Bush's office, Donald Gregg particularly, and the people he was working with, have been uh, supervising an enormous drug operation, which once again was bringing, sending uh, illegal arms or down to uh, the Contras and elsewhere, and bringing cocaine and other types of drugs back into the United States. But neither the Democrats aren't talking about this now. Are the libertarians talking about this, and do they put this into the framework of the drug law situation that you're talking about? Uh, we talk about a whole lot. Of course, we always have the trouble of getting the attention that we think it deserves. There have been a few Democrats have talked about it. Senator Kerry's office has Kerry, done some work. He's done on a lot it. of the investigation. Right, and uh, I think he's on to something, and I think we've gotten some other information too, of course, that uh, George or the CIA has given the Noriega over the years $200,000 a year. Oh, yes. And uh, they kept feeding him money, even when uh, Bush was the head of the CIA. Mm -hmm. I think uh, George Bush is uh, deep into it, well over his head. Somebody asked me once of, uh, if I thought George Bush knew about as much what was going on as, as Ronald Reagan. I think George Bush knew a lot more about what was happening in the CIA, because I think uh, Reagan was probably more removed from it, I mean, just by his own personality and maybe his age or something. Uh, but I think George Bush, through his office and through the, and through the fact that he was a member of this, you know, head of the CIA, I think he was very, very close to it. He knows exactly what was happening. And I believe the rule that once a CIA member, always a CIA member. And I think it's awful interesting. Can you imagine it would alarm a few of us in this country if all of a sudden we knew that the leader in the Soviet Union would be the head KGB agent. <laughs> and mm -hmm. here we take our head CIA agent and put him, you know, potentially the head of our entire country. Unfortunately, I wish that we could get this information out. Uh, and I continue to talk about it. But I sadly believe that there will be very little said, which means that the Democrat aren't doing it, that means they're involved too. They're involved also. And uh, yeah. I don't think there's any doubt about it. I mean, it was uh, even some of it got reported in the Iran-Contra scandals. We did know that there were uh, drugs, be drugs involved and, and they were selling uh, drugs back and forth. I think that might be the number one reason uh, for the drug laws. I mean, they use and play on the good people of America to support them, but I think the number one reason is not, not to have high prices for some uh, two-bit drug dealer as much as to raise the funds necessary to for governments to do illegal things, whether it's some terrorist government someplace or whether it's our own CIA to fund programs that they can't get Congress to fund. Uh, I think it's tragic and uh, the sooner we get rid of the drug laws, uh, the sooner this would end. There is a great push now for some type of national health service national health care. The United States is the only Western capitalist country outside of South Africa, if you consider that an advanced Western capitalist country, which doesn't have some type of comprehensive health care system. Are the libertarians for this or are they against it? Well, we're for, we're for a comprehensive health care system and we want everybody to have uh, uh, major medical coverage and the best insurance and the best uh, medical care. That's why medical care has to be delivered by the free market. If we don't care about medical care and quality, if we like lines and if you like the medical care the Indians get, and if you're happy with the Veterans Hospital, and if you're happy with how England runs things in the Soviet Union, then I guess we need another uh, uh, move in the direction of socialized medicine. Government now, even though we don't have a, a, a major uh, national program, government now delivers 60% of the health care in this country. And the more we spend, the higher the costs, the lower the quality, less people who get the care. 
I mean, it's a lousy delivery system. Poor people who can buy their TVs and cars and video cassette recorders have no health care. They buy the VCRs and their television and the cars in the marketplace. They get their health care uh, through government uh, program. With all this spending, there are still 38 million people who have no insurance whatsoever. Just devising another government program uh, which won't work, but just further push up costs and put controls and more doctors dropping out. And I think it's, uh, it's a total disaster. If it's a national health program run by the government, it's tragic. It won't work. It's going to ruin the care in the country. If uh, we care about people, we will have a national health care program, but it will be delivered by the free market. But the free market is what we have now. We have uh, bad health care. We have a greater percentage of GMP being spent on health care than those places, than those countries where they have the government sponsored. See, I don't, see, I don't agree. I don't think that uh, we have free market medicine. As I said, it's 60 percent is paid by government. We have coercive rules that force governments into these HMO organizations, government, uh, you know, the large companies had to offer these things, so they've been growing and now going bankrupt. And uh, when you pump a lot of money in, if government's paying the bills through Medicare or Medicaid, uh, this doesn't spread the money out. A lot of wealthy people get the benefits. The poor people don't seem to get through the, uh, you know, the maze of papers. But a lot of millionaires receive Medicare benefits, so they get their mm -hmm. hospital pay payments. But when they go in and pay and have a little insurance, what happens? The hospitals and the doctors and the labs tend to, you know, jack up the prices. So, and then the government has to come in and say, well, we're going to put on controls because the prices are too high and then we're going to ration care. So one problem leads, uh, leads to the next. But the problems you see today are a result of 50 years of uh, ever increasing government intervention in medicine. Uh, the, the government doesn't pay for 60% of our automobiles. You know, but they pay for 60% of our medical care. The, the automobile prices are high, but they're not as high proportionally speaking. Cost of automobiles is going up at the rate of about 4 or 5% a year. The cost of medical care is going up about 15 or 20%. Government's in, in uh, education. They're in college education. They're always subsidizing college education. Always the guy that doesn't get to go to college has to subsidize the guy that gets to go cost of education is going up about 15 to 20 percent. So as soon as you get government involved, quality does not go up, but the cost goes up, and there's not any fair distribution. Where do you stand on the, well, the right to lifers? Are those folks like you, the uh, anti-abortion people like the libertarians? Well, it's mixed. <laughs> they like me. <laughs> uh, because I am a right to life libertarian. I believe killing a fetus is an act of aggression. I've uh, been forced to be in a room, unfortunately, when I saw a three pound fetus, infant, taken out, breathing and crying and thrown in a bucket. I mean, I take my, I take my pledge seriously. I mean, that to me looked like an act of aggression. Besides, uh, if I give the wrong medication as a physician to a mother and I damage the fetus, the fetus, when it's born, can sue me. Obviously, it was legal, alive, and human, or it couldn't be able to, wouldn't be able to sue me. I know the fetus determines its inheritance rights at the time of conception. So I'm in, uh, I, I'm in uh, disagreement with our platform. Mm -hmm. But uh, there were enough libertarians who agreed with my position that I won on the first ballot at our convention. The truth is it's a difficult issue, and nobody likes to think about it because the way the law states now under Roe versus Wade, the fetus one second before birth at the weight of nine pounds still has no legal rights, and nobody enjoys defending that position. Very difficult because I, as a libertarian, I don't like to interfere with the privacy of a woman either. But how are we going to deal with this? I think we have to have respect for human life or we can't have respect for uh, individual liberty and the right to smoke a cigarette. So you think the government, ha <clears throat> the government has the right to force a woman to carry a fetus full term then? Well, I think the government has the right to protect life. Uh, I, it's sort of like saying if the baby's born and the IQ is 65 and they want it 100, does the government have the right to uh, force that person not to kill their baby? Yes, I do think so. I think the government has a right to protect life, but the government doesn't have the right to force anything. Uh, so it's, uh, it is difficult, uh, obviously. But uh, I think the bottom line is, is killing a fetus an act of aggression. And uh, the only way the libertarians or others who disagree with me on that, would, they would have to say that, uh, no, it's obviously an act of aggression. There's no debate there. It's that the fetus is not a person. The fetus is not alive and it's not human. 
And I, as a physician, have a lot of trouble with that. I mean, I know it's alive, I know it's human, I know it's legal. So uh, this is very unique, and uh, I don't advocate any federal laws. I don't even, you know, we libertarians nor this system that we have advocated federal laws to uh, uh, deal with uh, theft or murder or anything. You know, it's all handled by the state. So I think that the states would handle it differently. I think courts would handle it differently. I think juries would handle it differently. But uh, I think uh, under my ideal situation, we wouldn't have people having uh, abortion on demand and using it as birth control and having a callous, careless attitude about uh, life and instead of having less illegitimate pregnancies or births, uh, illegitimate or unwanted pregnancies, now it actually, uh, it was intended to help difficult situations. But what it has done is that the teenager sometimes can have three abortions in a year which is sad and it's a tragedy and I've seen the tragedies, I've witnessed them and I have great empathy for them but I also have great respect for the principles of freedom and I don't want to infringe or compromise my concept of what liberty is. What's the libertarian solution to the farm problem? Just free market? Free market, get the government out of it. You know under Ronald Reagan the um, uh, subsidies in 1980 were 10 billion dollars a year. They've gone up to 26 billion dollars a year and there's just as many bankruptcies as ever. Prices are wildly fluctuating as ever. Uh, I think it'd be much better if we got rid of all the subsidies and gave the farmers steady prices and a sound dollar. Low interest rates, prices that didn't jump all over the place, which is a reflection of the dollar's value rather than just commodity values. Obviously, when there's a drought, uh, prices are going to fluctuate more than others. But uh, this whole idea that when pr farmers produce too much, we're supposed to subsidize them. When there's a drought and they produce too little, we're supposed to subsidize them. And now I hear there's an early frost coming. <laughs> and now they're going to have to be bailed out for the early frost. You know, First it's overproduction, and then there's a drought, and then there's an early frost. I think the idea is wrong. I think it's bad economics and morally it's, it's wrong. I mean, uh, I'm having a bad year this year in medicine. I mean, should I ask you to be taxed so that you can send me some money because I'm having a bad medical year or somebody else has a business that doesn't do well? Sure, you can have sympathy and if he's your friend or relative, you can help him if you want. But to be able to coerce a non-farmer to pay him because he needs something or wants something violates all concept of rights. Nobody can demand something and, and call it a right. Everybody has a right to their life and their liberty, but they don't have a right to somebody else's property, and they can't use the government to coerce in order to get it. If you became president, would you abolish the Federal Reserve or try to, since it's a constitutional uh, question also, Well, and try to break the power of the banking system in the country? We'd, we'd get rid of the Federal Reserve, but unfortunately it is a constitutional question, but it shouldn't be. <laughs> the founders were rather clear. They, said they authorized no central bank. Uh, they said we could not emit bills of credit, which is paper money. They said that only gold and silver could be uh, legal tender, and the only monetary function that the Congress had was to mint gold and silver coins. So if we'd follow the Constitution, we would not have a central bank and we would not have a fiat paper currency. We would have a gold or silver standard or both. Uh, we believe that we should have honest money, which is a commodity standard. We don't believe in counterfeiting. We don't believe the individual can counterfeit paper and give it to people and say, this is money of real value. But we don't think the politician and the Federal Reserve can do that either. We'd get rid of the Federal Reserve and we think it would not only uh, help the economy, what it would do is would help the people because the people would save their money again, uh, prices would be lower, interest rates would be lower, and uh, we'd eliminate the business cycle. So the sooner we get rid of the Federal Reserve, the better. Uh, what would you do about the deficit, this enormous def deficit we have? The deficit should be eliminated by one technique, cutting spending. You can't cut spending until we decide as a people what we want from our government. If we want welfare and warfare, the budget will never be balanced. We're going to have an economic calamity and it's going to be very, very major. If we want some sense to our government, we should balance the budget. We should do it immediately and it should be done by cutting and it should be cut both domestically and internationally. We certainly can cut military spending because a lot of the military spending has nothing to do with national defense. We do not have to sacrifice defense. I believe if we change our policy, 
we could have a better defense, but we would uh, spend a lot less money, especially overseas. Same way at home. It's too much welfare. We cut back on welfare. It's too much interest on the national debt. A sound currency would lower the interest payment. So we would balance the budget and media at a much lower level. I think it would be the greatest thing in the world for the economy. Do you have a last statement you'd like to make for our viewers? Uh, yes, for, I would like to suggest to the viewers that uh, uh, you should uh, look at your choices. I think this year you do have a choice. I think it's foolish to waste your vote. Voting Republican and voting Democrat is a pure waste of your vote. So if you want to vote for less government, if you want to say you're not satisfied with the status quo, then you have to vote libertarian. If you stay at home, which many people are doing, they're staying at home these days because they are disgusted like we are, but they don't think as much worth, much chance of changing things. But if you vote Republican or Democrat, it makes no difference whatsoever. If they like what they have, if they're satisfied with the status quo, it doesn't matter. But if you don't want to waste your vote, if you want to make your vote productive, make your vote count, Come join the Libertarians, vote Libertarians, send the message because even if we get 5 or 10 or 15 percent of the vote, we will revolutionize politics in this country for the next 100 years. And that's what we want to do. We want to set the stage for the 1990s when the Libertarian Party can be a predominant force in this country. The other major story which could have impact on this election is in reference to the October Surprise Group in which in 1980, while Reagan was running for president against Jimmy Carter, his operatives arranged with the Ayatollah Khomeini not to release the American hostages in the embassy until after the election in return for clandestine arms shipment. And this was confirmed by the head of uh, SAVAK, or the U.S. Bureau Chief of um, SAVAK, who is also a CIA operative, allegedly, who told uh, uh, Pacific um, um, radio that he had information that Khomeini had ordered that the hostages not be released until Reagan was actually inaugurated as president and that they were left sitting uh, in the airplane in uh, Tehran until they were given word that indeed Reagan was now president and they could be um, sent over. But there was even a more interesting revelation from Jimmy Carter when he was on Larry King's uh, radio talk show on June the uh, 15th where uh, some caller asked him point blank uh, if he gave substance to the rumors that the Reagan-Bush campaign had cut a deal with uh, Iran to uh, de delay a release of the hostages and Carter said there were reports made to me before the election that this was going on that the hostages would not be released until after the election and that the Reagan administration would see to it that weapons sales would be restored to Iran either directly or indirectly um, through the Israelis. So Carter himself confirmed that while he was president he heard this um, um, rumor. So when he was asked if he thought this story would ever uh, come out, if the facts would ever be um, confirmed and brought to light, he said, I don't have any doubt that eventually in the next few years the facts uh, will come out. In fact, he hinted that he himself might be willing to um, bring this story out to the uh, public if the Dukakis campaign uh, wanted him to. When Larry King um, asked him if he was going to participate in this year's presidential campaign, Carter replied, if Dukakis calls on me to clarify a controversial issue where I was personally involved and know that the facts need to be revealed, I'll certainly do that through the media. That seems to indicate that uh, Jimmy has a pretty explosive story that could knock Bush out of the uh, waters because this would be one of the biggest scandals in American history because it would be high treason if the Reagan-Bush uh, campaign team had negotiated with the uh, Iranians to keep the American hostages there in uh, prison in Tehran longer than they needed to just to help um, elect Reagan. And if he illegally uh, supplied weapons to Iran where Congress had specifically uh, forbid this for the first years of his um, administration, this would be a major um, scandal. It's interesting how the American media has just completely uh, covered up this uh, story. Flora Lewis wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times that brought out the essential facts, but no reporter was assigned to the story, the Times has not come back to it, and no other American media has taken the story up. Bonnie Sadar was on Ted Koppel's uh, Nightline 
after the Iranian uh, passenger plane was shot down uh, by the American uh, military. And in the course of his, this discussion, he started to bring the story out, and Ted Koppel just shut him up. Yeah. <laughs> He's good at that. Koppel's He's, good. That's his um, um, function in the American uh, media. So uh, the American media have just uh, really laid off a bush. I mean, there's all kinds of stories they could uh, hit bush with, and so far uh, we've heard none of them. Although the left-wing press and the alternative press has been pursuing these stories diligently.